Welcome back. Today's lecture goes with assignment 6 and is going to speak some more to us about rates of change. So let's begin by talking about what we mean by an average rate of change. The average rate of change, I'll write it like this, is simply the slope of a secant line joining any two points on a curve. And that's an expression that we have been talking about and thinking about and working with for a while. So let's use a particular example. Let's suppose that we're talking about a function f of x, which is equal to 2x cubed minus 5x plus 1. And we want to find the average rate of change over the interval from minus 1 to 2. So, it's simply the slope of the secant line joining those two points. And so it'll be f of 2 minus f of minus 1, all over 2 minus minus 1. And check my work, but I believe that'll be 7 minus 4 over 3, which is equal to 1. So the average rate of change of the function uh, 2x cubed minus 5x plus 1 over the specific interval minus 1 to 2 is simply 1. And that's all there is to that particular point. Now recall this, that the tangent line to a function, let's say y is equal to f of x at a point p is equal to, is defined to be the limiting value of PQ as Q approaches P. So this is where Q is also on F of X. And that's a very important definition for the tangent line. So if we use that idea and we talk about two points where P is X F of X, and q is some point x plus h, f of x plus h, just a general point, then the slope of the tangent line at p will equal the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And we have made the statement previously that this is a very important definition. Slope of the tangent line, sometimes called the derivative, often called the derivative. Please notice that embedded in that definition is the slope of a secant line. And the secant line becomes a tangent line as h goes to zero which forces the point Q to get arbitrarily close to P. So let's use that definition to compute the slope of the tangent line, or the derivative, at any point on the function, which is f of x is equal to 2x cubed minus 5x plus 1. So this is going to be a little bit messy, a little bit long, maybe a little difficult fitting, but we'll do the best we can. So the slope of the tangent line, or the derivative, is sometimes notated as follows, f prime of x. And by our definition, it'll be the limit as h goes to 0 of this function evaluated at x plus h, I do wish I could be a little bit finer with this stylus. So that's f of x plus h minus f of x. I'll have to go down a little bit. Hopefully you'll understand. And all of that is divided by h. All right, so at this point, there's a lot of computation to be done. We have to cube this, multiply this out, 
run through the minus sign, simplify, try to get it as combined as we can, and I'll skip a couple of steps that I assume you all can figure out, and I'll jump right to the chase, that this simplifies quite a bit to this intermediate expression. 6hx squared plus 6h squared x plus 2h cubed minus 5h all over h. And I would suggest that you actually go back up here and do all the work and see that you do get to this point. And now if I simply divide through by h, I get the limit as h goes to 0 of 6x squared plus 6hx plus 2h squared minus 5. And as h goes to 0, this is equal to 6x squared minus 5. And that represents the derivative of the original function. And luckily we do have rules that we will come up with that will simplify that work greatly. So continuing along, here's some important information. And we want to make sure that we understand that the slope of a function, which is the same as the instantaneous rate of change or derivative at the point at the point a comma f of a is equal to by definition the limit as h goes to zero of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. So that represents the slope of the function. Now again, can't emphasize this enough, right here is the slope of the secant line. This makes the slope of the secant line become a tangent line. And uh, to be more specific, this is the slope of a secant line through the points a f of a and a plus h f of a plus h. So finally let's look at a, a real-world example of this and let's consider a function s of t which is a position function and by a position function we simply mean a function which describes where a particle is at any particular time t. So the instantaneous rate of change will be given by the limit as h goes to 0 of s of t plus h minus s of t over h. And what I'd like you to notice here is that on the top this expression right here represents a distance. The difference between two positions is a difference, is a distance. And on the bottom we have a time. So this much is the average rate of change or the average speed from t to t plus h. When I let the limit as h goes to zero do its magic this entire expression now gives me the instantaneous rate of change at the point t and this is equal to the velocity at t the actual speed of the particle at t So again, continuing with notation, here's what we just said, that the derivative with respect to time of the position function is equal to the velocity function. And that should make sense. Velocity tells you how position is changing with respect to time. If the velocity is 2, 2 meters per second, then that means that 
every second the position increases by 2 meters. Probably what is more interesting than this is to consider what the derivative with respect to time is for the velocity function. And that, as I think you could probably guess, is acceleration. Acceleration is measured in meters per second squared, which always looks a little weird to me, but it makes a lot more sense when you think of the units for acceleration being meters per second per second. And what this helps us see is that acceleration measures how velocity changes with respect to time. So, with the same idea, if acceleration happens to be 2 meters per second squared, or 2 meters per second per second, all that means is every second the velocity increases by 2 meters per second. If acceleration is 0, that simply means that the velocity is not changing. So whatever it was at the beginning is what it is at the end. So that concludes our lecture for today, and see you next time.